All right, we'll make a start on the tutorial then. Um, I've I've got uh, some notes up, quite a lot of notes up actually, for this tutorial uh, on a blog that I keep at this address here, dave.if90.net. Um, now in the past classes, um, I've had some trouble accessing it. I think it's not liked being suddenly hit by a lot of people at once from one place. Um, so if anyone if anyone can't if it's if, if it's giving an error message for anyone, just um yell out, and I'll give you an alternative to view the same content. Okay, so it's dave.if90.net, and uh, I've got this unit's notes, the KRB two one six, today's notes under tutorials in week two. Okay, and uh, I've got a few posts here. Um, first of all, I've got uh, a copy of uh, the lecture slides and a, a recording of the lecture that I gave yesterday. Um, these are actually the old ones from last year. I'll update these with uh, yesterday's version as, as soon as I get a chance, um, but the content didn't change all that much, so if you need to refer um, to anything in those um, you can find that there. Uh, I've then got a um, a gallery of some of the previous assignments that students have done in this unit. Um, just because I know people like to uh, people like to see what what other people have done in the past as sort of a, a bit of a benchmark. Um, these are from two years ago. I think Deb's first lecture she gave some examples of more recent ones from last year. Um, but any of the any any of the recent examples that, by any of the previous examples that we will show you, um, I'd just like to reiterate that um, in the past that this this unit uh, this assignment was all done in the first half of the semester. So just keep that in mind that you've got twice as long to do this as as these students had. Um, so I, I've, I've I took screenshots of them. I've got links. To uh, I've got links to the URLs as well. You'll probably find that a lot of these, the websites have since either changed or the URLs are, are broken entirely. Um, but there's there's so that's why I took screenshots, put a gallery up there, so at least you can see the sort of variety of visual designs that people that students have implemented in the past. Okay, the next post here is. Uh, is the same content that again I I added to the end of the lecture yesterday about web hosting and domain name registration. Um, so a lot of the content was duplicated from this post. So there's more detail here um, on sort of all that information that I went over. I think we we've kind of covered it pretty well, so I'm not going to go through it in detail now. But I will just say that. Um, uh, we do need everyone to have their web hosting and domain name registration sorted by next week's class. Um, um, for this week, it doesn't doesn't matter so much. But if, if you want to start um, actually working for the for the for the for the for the rest of the for for today's class, I'm going to be using the QUT web server. And if you do want to um, follow along on that, you can. But for the for after this week, I'll be um, using demonstrating everything with external hosting. Um, so if if you if you've if you've not if this is something that you've not done before, just keep in mind that um, if you purchase your domain name and your web hosting separately, it can take a couple of days for your domain name to resolve to your to your web hosting. So just keep that in mind and and try and um, if you still need to do that, get that done sooner rather than later. Um, but definitely, um, you need to be able to have it work in and, and be able to access it and everything by um, next week's class. Uh, if if you still need help or have questions about any of that, um, if if you um, have have questions about a particular package or something that you don't understand, um, then feel free to email me, uh, and I, I will do my best to answer your questions from that. But it 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 should be pretty straightforward. Okay, the next post here is a uh, um, is about the web design process. Now, a lot of the a lot of the 
examples that we go through in the tutorials are going to be quite, um, they're going to seem quite te technical based. Um, and I think often people get the wrong impression that that means that this is a, a technical unit that we care more about your technical implementation. But I don't want you to get that, that impression. Um, we're, we're very much um, equally, if not more so, interested in the whole design side of things. Um, the reason that we focus on the technical stuff in the tutorials uh, is because that's the format in which it's easiest to demonstrate that sort of thing. Um, uh, okay, but my point is just don't, don't, don't neglect the design side. And so we expect that you, you'll bring all of that knowledge that you've and all those skills uh, in terms of, of, of visual design and, and interaction design um, that you've already accumulated throughout this course and then combine it with sort of the new technology that we'll be teaching. Um, so, so while we will mostly in the tutorials be, be, be doing technical demonstrations, um, uh, uh, particularly for the first assignment, um, uh, you need to make sure that you're, you're focusing on, on the design side of things as well. And a big part of that of what we want to see in the first assignment is that um, you're developing some sort of design process or you're communicating what your design process has been, how you've, how you've gone from your initial idea conception to your, your basically your, your um, implementation pitch or brief, which is, which is what your assignment one document will be. Um, and obviously we're going to teach you, we're going to start early with teaching the technical stuff because having some knowledge of that is going to form, inform the kind of choices that you're going to need to make in, in that design process. So there's a few links here, um, but again, obviously do, do your own research into that as well. And again, it's not something that we can teach you hard and fast rules about because everyone will develop their own, their own design process which works best for them. Um, okay, and then I've got a post um, with basically some links to compilations of various portfolio websites. Okay, that's probably one of the first things you're going to need to do for assignment one is your review of existing portfolio websites. Again, these links are a little old, so um, so do do your own research again. But this is this is a place to start uh, if you need it. Um, the thing I want to stress about this is is make sure when you're reviewing uh, existing portfolio sites that um, you're not just doing sort of a black and white comparison between this is a good portfolio and this is a bad portfolio. You, you really need to focus on, in everything to do with design really on the context. So, so all, all portfolio websites aren't necessarily going to be useful for all, all types of, of, of people who might use those portfolios. Okay, so for example, the type of portfolio that might be really good at communicating the the work and the the skill set of a programmer might be very different and probably would be very different to the type of portfolio that would be most effective for communicating um, a, a photographer's or a designer's portfolio, for example. Okay, so think about the context of, of, of what, the, what the type of work is and what the portfolio is trying to achieve, and so then once you've done that, you can then apply that to your own, your own work, um, your own compilation of work in your own portfolio. What it is that that you're trying to communicate with your portfolio. Okay, and then I've got a uh, a post that you may have seen before um, yeah, about just some web design development tools which um, fits into your, your design process. Um, and again, feel free to take or leave as much of this as you want, but these are just some of either commonly used tools or ones that I personally have found useful. So you've got things like note-taking tools. The, the, what I like to use is Evernote, um, but other people use like Tumblr blogs or even just paper, pen and paper, but I think some way to collect your ideas so that you can go back and look over them later is, is um, a good place to start. Uh, then just a, a little bit about design and prototyping tools. So again, whether you like to do that in Photoshop or Illustrator or use more specialized tools like these links I've got here, different um, wireframing tools, um, something for visual prototyping. Um, although a lot of people like to actually just um, 
do their initial visual design in the browser uh, as well, and that's fine too. Uh, then a code editor is something you're obviously going to need. This will be this will come down to personal preference as well. Um, so rather than rather than telling you which one to use, I'm just going to give you a link to a bunch of them. Um, do your own research. There's plenty of good free ones there. The ones the one that they have on these computers is um, the free version of Komodo Edit. If you already know it and use it, that's fine. Um, that's a perfectly good editor. Um, and you may find that you might might find that your preferences change um, um, as you sort of if you move into more uh, technically complex development, um, you might you might find find that changes. Uh, an FTP client is something that you're probably going to need. Um, that's how you get the files from your computer to your web server. Um, and a free and popular one is FileZilla. Um, and I think these computers all have that now. Uh, and then obviously you're going to need some web browsers to test on. Uh, I've got some information about various different useful development plugins like Firebug and Web Developer Toolbar. And then a little bit of information on options for testing on multiple browsers. Uh, okay, including um, including some cloud services which which allow you to uh, to choose a whole myriad of different browsers and different versions on different platforms. Now we're not going to be too concerned about we're not going to be super strict about cross browser compatibility, you know, on every version of every browser. But it is something we want you to consider. Okay. So, um, so I've glossed over a lot of that stuff pretty quick because I think it's it's more worth it's more useful for you if you just sort of read through it yourself and then explore the links and, and do your own research. But I'll move on now to the stuff I really want to uh, kind of demonstrate. So, um, so where I finished up with the the lecture yesterday was we looked at you know, sort of how the web has changed and and why. Why we need why we need to move to um, dynamic web development and and what that is. So this was sort of the main diagram from from the lecture, uh, just illustrating the difference between a static website and a dynamic website. So um, so just to kind of go over that again, you've got in the client server model the client being essentially your computer or other device, phone, whatever it is that's running a, a web browser is requesting um, is requesting a certain resource from the server computer. The server being what stores the website and, and all of the files and, and uh, other stuff associated with that. So, in the case of a static website, the browser requests um, essentially just an HTML file from the server, and those HTML files just sit there on the server, on a hard drive, as files, and they're sent as those files back to the browser, which then interprets the HTML and, and renders it visually. Okay, uh, and then, so on the dynamic side of things, as we can see, as far as the, the client computer, as far as the web browser is concerned, it really doesn't, it really is not concerned too much with the operation of the dynamic website. As far as it's concerned, it's still just asking for information and getting back HTML as response. So all of the all of the difference occurs on the server. So rather than having our HTML file sitting on the server, we actually um, we actually call a, a a script, a bit of bit of programming code, um, which will then interpret. Um, interpret the request and certain other conditions and variables and we'll usually uh, pull its content from a database uh, and or other data sources and then um, and then output output the result of that script into HTML so by the time it gets back to the browser it's still just seeing HTML as far as as far as the web browser is concerned it really doesn't know or care whether it's whether it's requested something from a static web website or a dynamic website. As long as it gets back HTML, that's all it cares about. So that's probably the the one big important thing to remember is that uh, is that with PHP, which is going to be the language that we'll look at, uh, which is essentially this part of the diagram, the script there, um, 
it, it all happens on the web server. Okay, so PHP is a server-side scripting language. It's a programming language, um, and it allows us to create dynamic websites. Okay, so in, 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 in an HTML is not, not a, strictly a programming language. It's a markup language. Its, it's only job is to define the structure of a document. So, okay, so to tell the browser how to output a heading differently to a paragraph, differently to uh, a list. For example, okay. So there's nothing in HTML which actually allows it to dynamically adapt to different different conditions and and adapt the content that it that it gives back. Um, so as I said, because the PHP code must be executed on the web server, um, one of the one of the first things to sort of understand is that you can't just simply open up the PHP file in a web browser and expect it to work like you might be used to with an HTML file. Okay, the, the PHP actually needs to be executed by a web server running the PHP interpreter uh, in, in order for the PHP code to actually do anything. Um, so PHP. I mean, I, the, I guess the good thing about the good thing about programming is um, once you know one programming language, you kind of you kind of know them all. So if you've got any experience, any exposure to any other sort of programming languages, I think almost everyone would have done KIB two hundred four um, before this, and we did touch on a little bit of JavaScript. So if you remember anything about that, then then some of these. Uh, some of these concepts should hopefully seem somewhat familiar, but if you don't remember anything, that's that's fine as well. Um, um, okay, and so I've got here something that might seem unusual about PHP at first is that um, it's commonly written interspersed with HTML, similar similar to how similar to how JavaScript can be, but most most programming languages. People are used to just writing in the one language, and so you'll open up a file, and all of the code in that language is going in, in that file is going to be the one programming language. But more often than not, in in PHP, what we're actually doing is writing HTML and interspersing the PHP uh, throughout that. So I've got a code example of a um, very simple PHP script here, and I'll I'll I'll. Uh, I'll run this just to as an example. Now you don't have to you don't have to worry about um, typing in this code as as I do it or anything. Um, I'm, at this point in this intro to PHP thing, I'm less concerned that you you kind of remember the syntax rather than just having some awareness of the types of things that you can do with PHP. Um, I'll give you links to to look at this stuff in more detail later, but um, but right now I'm I'm, I'm mainly interested in 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 just what the kind of things that it can do. Um, okay, so so I've got I've got um I've got here in my uh, in my code editor uh, I've just got a, a PHP file here. So the first thing, which may seem seem obvious, is that um, the only difference. The only difference in naming uh, your your files between an HTML file and a PHP file is that uh, your PHP files have to end in the in the file extension .php. Um, so that's simple enough. But inside of that, it, it can still look like a normal HTML file. Um, okay, and anywhere where we actually write PHP, because we can intersperse the two languages together, we need to be able to delineate where the PHP code begins and ends. And we do that using the opening PHP tags, which looks like this, okay, and the closing PHP tag that looks like this. And then anything that goes in between that is going to be interpreted uh, as long as it's sitting on a web server running, running uh, the PHP interpreter, uh, that code will be executed there. Um, so at the moment, this this file is just sitting on my local hard drive, and if I if I look at this here, um, I'll just demonstrate what I was sort of talking about before. Where if I just attempt to open this in my browser, okay, you can see what happened. What's happening is it's 
it's it's not rendering any of the HTML, okay, and it's it's simply just outputting the code that I've written. Okay, and this is not how we want it to operate it. We want we want what we want it to interpret the HTML and we want the PHP code to be executed and then output. So in order for this to work correctly, I have to put the PHP file on the web server. Now for for this week's example, I'm going to use the QUT web server, but the process for putting it on any other remote server would be the same. If if you recall in the lecture when I talked about running a local web server on your computer um, using MAMP or WAMP or something like that, then you can just copy the files into the correct folder and, and it will operate like that. But more commonly, or, or your final site will, will be hosted on a remote server. So we have to use something like an FTP client to transfer the file over to uh, the web server. So I've got um, my FTP client here, FileZilla. And basically, I need some information to connect to that. So there'll be an address, a username, and a password. Um, all of these details, this information, you will find on the home page of the QUT web server, which is webhost.ci.qut.edu.au. Okay, if you're interested in looking at this week, um, but as I said, you're not really going to be using that this after this week. So if if you don't. If you don't want to, that doesn't that doesn't really matter. But uh, anyway, um, so there's the FTP information. There's my FTP address, and then I would just use my QT login credentials. So that sort of information is information that your web hosting provider will give you uh, when you when you per purchase your package. So they'll give you a setup email with that information. Um, so I put that information in. I've had it already pre-saved as an account here, and then all of a sudden I'm browsing files and folders on a remote computer, and I can generally operate this just as if it was a folder, a folder on my, my local computer. So I can create directories and delete things, and usually you can just drag files from your local computer to the remote computer, and they'll upload like that. Now the second part of this equation is how do we then actually access that remote file in the web browser and in the case of when you get your own hosting it's going to be via your domain name. Okay, you'll type in your domain name and that will point to where your files are on the remote, remote server. Normally there's a special folder or there, there's always a special folder where you have to put your files on the web server. Again you'll be given that information but it's usually called something like public underscore HTML, or alternatively you might see it called um, www, or maybe something else, um, it depends. But that, that's commonly, commonly the, the name of the folder that you need to put it in. Um, okay, so that is now on the remote server. I need a URL to be able to access it. In the case of uh, the QUT web server, the URL looks like this webhost.ci.qut.edu.au forward slash and then a username that's my staff username and then load that up okay and you can see here I've got a list of, of um, folders and files and these all match the contents of the public HTML folder on my QT web web server account. Okay, and so um, I can navigate to the um, place where I've actually uploaded this file. Okay, and there it is, test.php there. And if I run it here, okay, now you can see the output looks very different to when I just tried to open it up in the browser. Okay, so we've got to forget now that we're dealing with dynamic dynamic websites about simply just um, opening up the, the files in the browser. Don't do that anymore. We have to put them on the web server and then go to the appropriate URL and then um, the, the, the PHP code inside that will actually uh, be executed. So if I look at, if I take a look at the, um, the actual code that's output here, okay, in the browser it just, it just looks like uh, the text hello world, okay, but Again, just to reiterate this point about all the browser ends up seeing is HTML. Okay, you'll notice in that my original script, I've got some HTML here, but notice the difference between 
these lines of PHP in my original script and the uh, resulting output in the web browser. Okay, so there's no PHP here. What this is, is the result of the execution of a PHP script on the web server. So this bit of PHP that I've written here, uh, echo hello world, the echo statement is one of the most common, if not the most common thing that you will do with PHP and it simply just outputs whatever you tell it to, to the browser window. And it does it where where you place it within the code. So if I had if I had have put it uh, above the, the the doc type, it would have output there. But if I put it between uh, heading tags, then that's where it outputs. Okay, so where you place it is is sort of important. The echo statements. Um, now I should just mention that I I used Farzilla to upload upload that file initially. Um, just to, just because it's quicker, what, what I'm going to do now is um, my editor, along with a lot of editors, um, will actually have a built-in FTP client. So rather than having to go through the process of saving your file and then uploading it each time you make a change, uh, you can just uh, log on to the FTP account through here and it will automatically upload it every time you save it. So that's what I'm doing here and you can see that that's what's happened there. Okay, it's just I've saved it and it's uploaded the file. Um, so I'm not I'm not now running this. I'm still running. I'm still uh, saving it to the to the remote web server. Is the point that I'm trying to make there. Um, I'm just not doing it through FileZilla anymore. So I'm going to close that down and do it this way. Okay, so I've made a change here. I've just added heading tags. And if I refresh this now, okay, you can see its output. And there are the heading tags. And there's the hello world bit of text is just the result of of processing that one particular line of PHP. Okay. All right. Now this this picture here just sort of reiterates that example. The browser the browser never sees the PHP code. It sees the resulting output of the the, what 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 is um, the PHP that's executed on the web server, and then it's just returned HTML. Okay, so th that's different to a client-side scripting language like JavaScript, in which in which the uh, the JavaScript is just sent to the web browser, and it's the web browser's job to interpret the 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 lines of JavaScript code, and then and then um, execute those. So, so that's probably it's probably one of the more confusing things to get your head around first of all, but an important thing to remember. Okay, so I'm going to briefly go over some of the common features of the PHP programming languages and where they might differ to, to other languages that, that you may, um, may or may not be familiar with. There's certainly not an exhaustive list of all the features, but I've sort of picked either the most common ones or the ones that will be most relevant uh, to when it comes to creating WordPress themes. Um, so again, don't worry too much about attempting to uh, remember the exact syntax of any of this stuff. Um, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you today um, is actually more low level, more complex than anything you'll need to really do with WordPress. But I think some level of understanding of the kind of things that that it can do will 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 make that process later on um, a bit easier. And I'll give you I'll, I've got links here to where you can go and and look at more detailed information on all this stuff as well, which which might be a, a useful thing to do um, between now and next week as well. Okay, so we'll start with comments. So uh, comments in, in programming are simply a way of um, annotating our code. So they're lines of code that are ignored. Um, they're not executed. They're ignored by the PHP interpreter or compiler, um, and they're simply just there, uh, basically, to document document the code, to remind you or whoever else might be reading the code, usually what what the following code is going to do. In PHP, there's two ways that we can write comments. We can write a, a single line comment, which looks like this here, and it simply just starts with a double forward slash. 
Okay, and if we want to write a comment that goes over multiple lines, then we bookend it with these characters here. So the forward slash star, and then the reverse of that at the end. Okay, they're the two kinds of comments that you can write. Okay, so this is important to remember the difference between this and an HTML comment. So PHP actually has the more common style of, of commenting syntax. Um, HTML's commenting syntax is actually reasonably reasonably unique among programming language, languages. But the point is um, because you're mixing because you're mixing HTML with PHP, um, you need to make sure you're using the right commenting style um, whether you're whether the bit of whether the comment that you're writing is actually within the HTML or within the PHP. Okay, so if it's within the PHP tags, as, as this is here, you write the PHP style comments. If it's not within those tags, then you write it as an HTML comment. Uh, if you do it the other way, it will be confused and won't it won't um, it won't know to interpret it as a comment. Okay. Um, all right. We'll look at um, variables. So variables are in every programming language, language there, and they're they're simply they're simply things that we use to store bits of information that we can use later. Um, so in PHP, um, the there's a few rules for naming variables. Um, these dot point ones are quite common. They they um, for example, they, they have to begin with a letter or an underscore, not a number. They can only be made up of alphanumeric characters and underscores. Um, you can't have multiple word, I mean, you can't have spaces in your variable names, and uh, they're case sensitive. So a, a lowercase variable of the same name will be considered a different variable to an uppercase variable of that same name. Um, but the main one that's different with PHP is that. Um, the way you tell PHP that you're creating a variable is actually by starting the name of that variable with a dollar sign. Um, so anytime you create a variable or anytime you see it written like this, um, it's you have to start it with a with a dollar sign when you're referring to a variable. Um, so for example, here uh, is a bit of PHP code where I create some variables to store information about uh, a person, for example. Okay, and you can see each of the variables begins with a dollar sign, and because I because I can't use spaces in the variable names, if I've got multiple words, I'm using the technique of, of camel casing, meaning I start each subsequent word subsequent word with a capital letter. Okay, but that's just a that's a, just a styling convention thing. Okay, so we, we name the variable and then we use the equal sign to assign it a value. Uh, variables can have different different data types okay in this in this case the first two variables are a text string which are def defined by putting them in either a double or single quotes and the second two variables are numbers okay and there's there's more to say about variables uh, if, if you want to look into it in more detail and I've got a link to the I've got links throughout here to more information which would be worth would be worthwhile following and, and reviewing later on okay but essentially variables, is how we store bits of information, and in PHP they always start with a dollar sign. Uh, we have operators, and when we talk about operators, we're usually using um, them for doing uh, arithmetic or, or mathematical operations. So um, we can add, subtract, multiply, divide, increment, decrement um, um, variables or values. Um, but one big difference with PHP compared to um, a lot of other programming languages is the way that the uh, plus operator is interpreted. So in a language like JavaScript, for example, the plus operator is used both to add numbers together, uh, but it's also used for um, concatenating strings, and concatenation just means joining. So um, in, in JavaScript, if I wanted to, so this code example here, um, is outputting um, essentially these first two variable names. So it's attempting to join uh, the first name with a single space character and then with a last name. Now if I was writing this in JavaScript I'd be putting um, plus signs here in order to signify that I want to join those strings together. In PHP um, the plus sign is only used for um, mathematical addition. 
Uh, if you want to concatenate or join strings in PHP, then you use the full stop instead. Okay, and that's, only, that's the only major difference between PHP operators and, and other languages. Um, okay, we'll move on to functions. Now functions are functions are really the core of, of, of any programming language and um, they're put simply they're just um, blocks of lines of code which you can call repeatedly as many times as you want um, to do over and over again. Um, so for example in this this code example down here, okay if um, if if so this this little snippet of code here as I said will will output um, output uh, uh, the first name with a space and then the last name. Now let's say I want to do that a bunch of times throughout my code. Um, then rather than typing that line of code each time, what I can do is create a function which will do that for me and then each time I want that to happen I, I then just call that function. Now this is a pretty basic trivial example because it's only one line but this function might have ten, a hundred or a thousand lines of code in it. Um, so, um, so you don't want to be re you don't want to be retyping all those lines of code every time you want to perform that particular function, and you don't want to be going and modifying each version of that. It would just become a nightmare to maintain that code. Okay, so that's that's why we have functions. Um, you probably won't you probably won't in 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 your WordPress development need to write really any of your own functions. Um, but I'll just I'll just briefly shown you what it looks like if you do it uh, do anyway um, because it helps us understand a little bit how we we call other built-in functions which I'll m mention in a moment so basically there's two steps to using a function first of all you define the function so the bit of code that you want to be executed when you call that function and we use the function keyword give it a name and then usually um, we we send it some uh, some information to use within that function. So if I've got a function called print name, it's going to need to know the first name and the last name in order to output it. And so we send it that information between these rounded parentheses here, um, and you'll see these referred to as either function parameters or function arguments. Okay, and then they can be used inside of this function um, to to do whatever we want with them. In this case, output them to the browser inside of a paragraph. So that's defining the function, and then the second part is you call the function. So this single line here is calling the function once, and we simply write the name of the function, and then in the rounded parentheses, we send it the values. Now I could hard code values here. In this case, I'm sending it the variables that I've already created to use. And then in this example, I call the function, um, I call the function three times just to show that um, just to show that you can call a function as many times as you want. So if I was to run this code and, and um, look at it in the browser, this would be the resulting output. Okay, so the, for, for, for these three instances where I call the function, it will output one of these lines. Okay, and the lines will be made up of uh, paragraph tags. I've got a little typo there actually, that should be, that should not be a closing paragraph tag, but anyway. Um, so it outputs paragraph tags and then as you can see here the, the whatever's stored in my first name variable joined with a space joined with the last name variable okay and because I call the function three times it outputs it outputs that paragraph three times um, okay and then the the only other thing really um, that needs to be said about functions is they can optionally return um, return a value so I've got another example down here where I've got a function to calculate my BMI, my body mass index, okay, which is a simple calculation based upon um, my height and my weight. But rather than, let's say, rather than outputting um, the result of that, maybe I just want to perform that calculation and store the value to use later on. So, so that's exactly what I've done here. Again, the process is the same. I define the function here. So I've created a function called calculate BMI, which takes a height and a weight variable, and then um, and then I use the return keyword to return a value, and the value that it returns is this 
mathematical equation of weight divided by uh, the square of the height. So in calling the function then down here, I call calculate BMI, I send it my height in meters and my weight in kilograms variables for it to use for the calculation, and then the return value actually gets here assigned to this variable here called dollar sign BMI. Okay, and then later on I echo it out here. Okay, so but the point is that um, that quite often you'll get a return value from from a function, and and so that you can use it later on. Um, okay. So as I said, you think you probably won't do a whole lot of writing your own functions. Um, by by far, especially in, in, in the WordPress um, theme development, uh, what you'll actually be doing is is calling um, um, internal or built-in functions. Okay, so so PHP, like lots of other programming languages, they recognise that there's certain things that people do very commonly. So rather than having the programmer have to write write um, those those features out themselves every time, they package a bunch of of common functions into the programming language that you can just call um, without having to define them yourself. So in here I can modify, if if I was to run this example and, let's see, I'll do it, let's see if I can do it very quickly. So I'll copy this code and replace my PHP file, upload it to the server and refresh. Okay, so this is the output of that script there. Okay, so it's saying uh, Dave Wallace's BMI is, and then a number here with a whole lot of decimal points. Okay, so that looks a little bit messy to me, so what I'd really like to do is to sort of round that to a certain number of decimal points. And I could write my own function that does that, um, but because that's something that's, that's just very common, uh, there's a built-in function in PHP which will do this for me, um, and, and all I have to do is call it. So, um, so the built-in function which which does that for me is actually called round. Okay, and so I can modify this. I can modify this bit of code uh, with this line here. Make the change. Okay, and the only bit that's going to change is uh, the bit surrounding this BMI variable here. Okay, so rather than just outputting the joining up of all these bits of information with the BMI variable, what I do is I call this built-in function round, okay, and I pass it the value that I want it to round, and then this second parameter here um, refers to the number of decimal points that I want it to round to, so in my case, one decimal point. Okay, if I save that, upload it, and go back and refresh that page, okay, now it's outputting the, the rounded um, value. Okay, and if I change this parameter to 2, okay, it will give me two decimal points of precision. Okay, now the question that um, the question that is obvious to ask here is, well, how do we know how do we know what the built-in functions are? And the answer to that is, um, for any programming language, they have to be documented somewhere. Um, and in the case of PHP, uh, there's the PHP website, php.net, and there's a documentation section. Okay, and um, I've got a picture here of, of a screenshot of that, and part of it is uh, you can search for a function in a functions list. Okay, so on this website, all of the internal built-in functions will be documented. So, for example, I've got a link here to the um, to the documentation for that uh, exact function which I use, the round function. Okay, and if I go to this page, this is what it looks like. So. Um, so we get a uh, we get the name of the function, and then we usually get a formal definition, uh, a description of the parameters that you can send it, um, any what values it returns, and then usually some code examples of how to use it. Okay, and you can see down here there's a list of of many 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 other functions.
that, that it also has. So this is packaged within a bunch of functions which are mathematical functions. So all of these other ones will, will, do, will do mathematical types of, of operations or store mathematical values. Now, the thing about this official documentation is the way, the way that they've written it, I know, I know when you first start to look at it, um, can look rather confusing because it's got all of these square brackets and things and, and you know, it might look a little confusing. There's, um, there's, there's, a, uh, there, there's, there's a meaning behind all of this stuff, okay? So for example, the, the square brackets basically mean that anything inside there is an optional parameter. You can, you can pass it something for that parameter um, or you don't have to. Um, and then there's things like default values and all this sort of thing. Um, and they have to write it like that because they have to write the most precise definition of what the function does. But at the same time, I will admit it can look um, rather confusing. So, so if that if that's if that's a bit hard to wrap your head around, then um, you're 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 possibly better off um, simply sort of uh, if you're looking for a particular function, uh, just googling googling the answer. So, um, so for example, here where I, I just Google how to round a number to one decimal place in PHP and you'll no doubt find hundreds of links to examples explained in, in simpler language um, and, and, and with simpler examples. Um, so one common site which, which you'll see pop up over and over again is, is, is a good one called Stack Overflow, which is a site purely designed for people to ask questions um, about how to do things in various programming languages and get, um, get answers and examples for how to do that. And you'll find that you get there's there's usually multiple different solutions for for the same question. Um, so that would be my advice. Um, um, is 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 really kind of googling the answer and, and maybe uh, if 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 the the formal document documentation just seems a bit too cryptic. Um, okay, and as yes, as I say here. Um, most of the PHP that you end up writing, creating your WordPress uh, templates, uh, will involve calling um, WordPress's built-in functions, um, and to a lesser extent, PHP's built-in functions. So, really, what WordPress what WordPress is going to be is a bunch of PHP files which contains a bunch of pre-written functions which do certain things, like um, like let's say. Um, go and grab information from a database or output a bit, bit of a certain piece of information to the to the browser maybe the title of the site or the date of the date of a particular post okay and so all of those things will have been written um, uh, with built-in functions in WordPress so all you really and all you really have to do then is 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 find find the appropriate WordPress functions to call and figure out where you have to write them and then and and that's really that's really as involved as it gets with with, with writing a WordPress um, template. Okay, so I'll move on now uh, to conditional statements. So conditional statements are the part of a programming language um, which, as I said before, HTML lacks. There's no way there's no way of, of HTML being able to respond to different circumstances. Um, in a programming language with conditional statements, that's exactly what they're designed to do. So a conditional statement basically will say, uh, execute a different bit of code depending on if a condition has certain values. Okay, so the example I've got here, I'll just copy and run this example. Okay, so the example I've got here uh, is uh, the the purpose of this is to output a different welcome managed welcome message depending on the time of day. So first of all, I've got a variable here, current hour, which uses PHP's built-in date function, and the date function will return you a date in various different formats, and the parameter that you send it here, in this case, uh, a, a 
capital H, a string with just capital H in it, is telling me to just give me the current hour of the day. So the, the value returned from this and saved into the current hour variable is going to be a number between 0 and 23. So what I can do then is, is using that number display either good morning, good afternoon or good evening depending on, on what that number is. So I've got a conditional statement here and the, the, the syntax of that always looks like this. If some condition is true then do this, else if, and you can substitute else if logically for otherwise if, but else if this other condition happens to be true then do this bunch of code and then finally optionally we can say else this and the final else is just saying well if none of these conditions have been met then just do this thing as a last resort. So what I'm saying here is if the current hour is less than 12 in which case it's it's earlier than midday then output to the the window good morning otherwise uh, if the uh, current hour is less than 18 which would be 6 p.m. output good afternoon and otherwise if it's not less than either of those then just output good evening. The, the server, the server will use the the time clock on the computer that it's running on. Yeah. So there are, if if you want to look into that, there are ways of of defining a time zone and stuff for all of that that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. So let's see what this looks like. Okay. So there, it's outputting. Good afternoon, and if I look at my clock, okay, it's 4.54, so I should be able to logically come in and see that it's not less than 12, and in fact, I will we'll modify this and, and, and um, output in a paragraph, we'll go, sorry, Okay, so we'll output in a paragraph whatever value of current hour is returned. Okay, so we can see 16 there. Okay, in 24 hour time that's 4 p.m. So it's the, the, the 16th hour of the day. That, that, that seems to gel pretty well with, with my, um, my clock there, even though, as I said, it will be using the clock on the server. As long as my server is in the same time zone, that should, should, um, it should make sense. Um, so if it's 16, then obviously that's not going to be correct. Okay, but it is less than 18, so this one's going to be correct. Okay, and so therefore it's outputting that particular line there, good afternoon. Okay, and if I came back, if I came back after 6 o'clock and I refresh this page, it should change that output message to good evening without me having to go back and modify the code at all. Okay, so that's, that's what we talk about when we talk about automation uh, and, and also uh, dynamic adaptability. Um, we, we, we write it once and we use the programming logic to deal with different circumstances and then it will output different content and we never have to go back and modify that. Okay, um, we'll move on to arrays. Arrays are a, um, a, a type of object um, they, 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 you could say that they're a variable, but essentially what an array is, is a list of objects, a list of variables. Okay, and it can be of arbitrary length. It might contain nothing, it might contain one item, it might contain a hundred items. Um, and the reason that arrays are important to discuss is, um, is when we're looking at dynamic sites, um, usually there's usually there's a database involved. And a database is really um, just like a bunch of Excel tables, okay? And, and, and they, have, they have records or rows of information. And what you're usually doing when you want to get information out of the database is you'll, you'll query that database and ask it for a particular bunch of rows in one of these tables. And so those rows will usually be re um, returned as an array, as a list. Okay, so um, so anytime you're working with a database, the type of the the data format that you will get the the information returned in will be an array. Um, 
Okay, so there's, there's two ways of what we call indexing an array. So an, an, array, an array being a list of, of items, if we want to access an, a, an individual one of those items, then we need to have some way of telling it which of those items we want to access. So there's two ways of doing that. We can, we can index the array uh, numerically, okay, and say that there's, there's uh, an, an, an item at this particular number, and the other way is to index it based on a, um, a specific name. Okay, so we'll look at the numerically indexed arrays first. Um, this example here is um, how, how you can create an array of somethings, in this case an array of names of fruits. Okay, um, let me just add the PHP tag back in there. Okay, so I've got an array of fruits here that I've created. And the other thing is accessing, um, accessing a, an item out of this array. So this being an indexed, uh, numerically indexed array, the way that I access a particular item is by um, specifying a numerical index inside of square brackets here. So in this case, I'm saying in the fruits array, get me the element at index two. Now the important thing. The important thing to uh, remember about this, which often seems confusing at first, is if I run this code, um, logically you would expect it to output uh, orange, orange being the second item. But if I do run it, okay, you'll see that it outputs pear. Now the reason for that is, and Okay, and I've got this written in bold here is that array indexing, numerical array indexing in PHP always starts from zero, not one. Okay, so the first item is going to have a numerical index of zero, the second item a numerical index of one, and the third one a numerical index of two. So that's why when I ask, that's why, that's why I'm specifically not saying give me the second item when I, when I describe this, I'm saying give me the item at index two. Okay, so that's something that's often forgotten and often often causes um, problems. It may seem confusing, um, but there's, there's, there's good mathematical reasons for why it's done that way, um, and it's just something you kind of got to get used to. So it's always offset by one. Um, okay, so that's numerically indexed arrays. Uh, then we've got um, associative arrays. So is a bit more complicated um, creating an associative array. Okay, so when we created the numerical array, uh, all we really specified was the, the objects, the elements that we wanted to go into the array. And that's just because the numerical indexing happens automatically. One gets assigned zero, then one, then two, then three. With an associative array, we use a text string to identify um, the elements in the array. And that obviously has to be uh, unique. Okay, but the way we define the array then is we write the, the index, okay, and in, this, in, in an associative array, the index and the value are also referred to um, often as the key, the, the key and the value, a key value pair. So we've got the, the key, and then we've got the actual value. The key represents the which item it is in the array, and then the value is the actual bit of information that is stored. So these are the same variables from the earlier example, but rather than storing them as separate variables, I've created an array called person, and I use the, the variable names as the array index. And in this case, when I want to access a bit of information, then rather than putting a number in here, I write the, the name that uh, is associated with the particular bit of information that I'm interested in. Okay, and so, and, and, and you'll, see, you'll see me use this uh, in, in an example in a moment as well. Uh, and the, the other thing, the only other thing to really mention about arrays is that um, an array can actually contain arrays within arrays, nest, what's called nested arrays or multi-dimensional arrays which may seem confusing at first, but you can think of that as like if you have a spreadsheet, if you have a bunch of columns, okay, you've got a list of columns, but then within each column you've got a list of rows inside of that as well. Um, and so that's the same concept as a multi-dimensional array. 
Um, okay, we'll move on now to, um, this might be the last thing in this particular intro part. Yep. Okay, so we've also got loop constructs. Now loop constructs um, are worth talking about hand in hand with arrays um, because uh, we usually use them um, for, for um, performing operations on elements in an array. So a, a loop can take a few different forms, um, I've, and I've outlined two of them here. Um, again, don't worry too much if this syntax seems confusing, but just understand what it does. Um, so this first kind of loop is called a for loop, and essentially it's for performing uh, some lines of code a, a predetermined pre number of times. Okay, so we define the for loop like this, and I won't run this because I've got the output here anyway. We define the for loop by, by using the for statement and then inside of these rounded parentheses we give it three bits of information. We give it a... Um, we, 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 we have to create a variable which, which operates as a counter essentially. So we, we create that variable, that's the first part. The last part here is using the, the double plus, the increment operator, to add one to the value of that each time we go through the loop. And then the middle part here is the condition that needs to be met uh, for, for it to continue looping. So basically what this is saying is create a variable called i and set it to be equal to one. Each time we go through the loop add one to the value of that and then continue to keep looping while the value of i is less than or equal to five. Okay, and then this statement here will output the number is and then whatever that value of i happens to be at that iteration through the loop. So the output for that ends up looking like this. Okay, the number is 1, the number is 2, the number is 3, the number is 4, the number is 5. Output with, with um, break tags here like this. Okay, and then once, once it's gone through 5 times that condition no longer holds true and it breaks out of the loop and continues on with whatever other code uh, it it, it needs to keep going on for. Um, now that's that's one version of the loop, but probably a more useful version of the loop and one that you'll see used more uh, is the for each loop. You may also see the while loop, but they, they do similar things. Um, and they're, they're designed for looping over the elements in an array. So as we said before, an array can hold any number of items um, and and if you're, for example, if that array is being populated as the result of querying a database, then PHP isn't necessarily going, or you as a programmer when you're programming it, aren't necessarily going to know at the time of writing that how many, how many, uh, how many results are going to be returned. Okay, if I'm having to write some code which needs to output a certain number of, all, all of the posts that I have within my blog, then I could go and check that there might be 10 posts and write a loop that does it 10 times, but then someone might delete a post or add a post and then all of a sudden that code doesn't work. So this type of loop will basically say, perform this bunch of code for each item in an array, no matter how many items there are, until we've done it once for each one, and then continue on. Okay, so the way, the way that we then write this is we first of all have an array and then the loop looks like this. So instead of four, it's four each. And then we write, we essentially have two variables here. So this first one, this first one is the name of the array that we want to loop over. And the second one is a variable name that we create which we can then, which will refer to the current item in the list that we're looking at in that particular iteration of the loop. So you could read this as saying for each element in the person array output its value. Okay, so the first time through the loop it's going to get that one and then the second time through it's going to get that one and keep going through until there's no more elements left in the list or in the array. Okay, and so then it's going to echo the, the value out with, with a break tag. And so if I ran that the resulting output would look like this. Okay, and so you see each element in the list is output um, and then once it reaches the end of the list it will break out of the loop and continue on with whatever other with whatever other code it needs to execute. Um, and then this example here is uh, exactly the same except for the fact that sometimes in this first example we're just accessing the value 
not the key or the index. If we want to do that also, then we just write, um, we modify the, the for each loop to look like this. So the name of the, the name of the array and then as key value and then we can refer to the key and the value using those variables there. Okay, so in this example what I'm doing is outputting um, for each list item the, the key or the index and the value um, in, and I'm putting them inside an HTML, HTML table. Okay, again, don't worry too much about the syntax of that, just understand that that's what it does, okay? It loops over an array and performs some, perform some code uh, for each element in that array. Um, I've got a bit of a side note of slightly different ways of writing arrays here, just because you may see this um, written in WordPress uh, template stuff. Uh, and the only difference is that rather than using, you'll see I've normally used to define the start and end of a loop, for example, the opening and closing curly braces, you can also replace those by, um, by um, instead of having a closing curly brace, you have the end version of, of the loop. So for each and end for each, and then this gets replaced with a colon. Um, the reason for that, and I've got that exact same example written with that style here. The reason that you'll see that particularly in WordPress is because um, if, you have, if you have a lot of PHP interspersed with HTML, which, which mainly I haven't, I've had mainly just blocks of PHP here, but it's possible to have lots of it interspersed, then it's a bit easier to match up the start and end of a loop if you can match for each with end for each rather than just attempting to match up lots of opening and closing curly braces. Okay, but essentially they do exactly the same thing. Those two examples are functionally identical. Okay, I'll stop there because I want to move on to the main demonstration for today. Um, but uh, if if you if you do want to, I, I've put links I've put links throughout here for more information, and I definitely recommend I definitely recommend reviewing this, going through and reading exactly what I've written here, and exploring some of these other links. If you want um, even more in depth and background information on PHP after that, um, then these are the two links that I recommend. There's the W three Schools section on PHP which I've linked to a lot throughout um, those descriptions as well. And then I've got a link to, um, to um, a, a Linda video tutorial. If you, if you prefer doing video tutorials, that's stuck in an infinite loop, but we won't worry about that. But there's a, there's a link to that there, which if you've not used that before, you have access to that, you have free access to that um, via the university library website, their database section. You um, use your QT um, account to create a Linda account for that. Um, so again, really, you don't look. You don't need to know. You certainly don't need to be a PHP or a programming export expert to um, to create WordPress templates. So so don't don't worry about attempting to become an expert. But obviously, the the more background information you have and the more understanding you have, then then, then possibly it's going to make it a little easier later on. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on now to um, probably the most what I think is the most important part of this um, tutorial, and that is demonstrating how we go from a static website design development philosophy to a dynamic website uh, philosophy. Um, so as I say here, don't be alarmed by what might seem like complex code. Okay, a lot of what I'm going to show you here is stuff that you don't even need to do uh, to create to create a WordPress theme. WordPress actually takes care of it for you. What I what I'm demonstrating here is essentially a really simplified, stripped down version of 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 how WordPress operates. Um, um, and and I, I'm, I want you to be. I want you to be. Um, I want you to follow conceptually what I'm doing. So what it is that I'm doing, and and what I'm doing differently to if it was a static website, and then the reason that I'm doing that. Don't worry about. Don't worry about the the, the syntax or the programming, because um, as I said, a lot of it you won't even need to look at. I am, for example, going to 
show you a really simple database and have some PHP code which queries that database. That, for example, is something you don't need to worry about at all with um, with uh, with WordPress. It handles all of that for you. Okay, but hopefully, if we go through this, then the transition to to starting to make a WordPress template will will make more sense than if we had just started with that by itself. So I've got a download link to um, the completed example files here. If you do want to go through and look at them either now or later, um, there's no need to, to try and follow along and, and, and write the code with me. As I said, I, I prefer that you just um, conceptually uh, sort of follow what I'm doing. Okay, so I will, I'm going to get rid of this test.php file here delete that and what I've got in that archive is essentially two folders a static static site folder and a dynamic site folder so I'm going to start with the static site um, and see what that looks like and I'm going to have to make well I'm, I'm just going to upload it to the web server and Okay, here it is here inside of this folder. Okay, so this this here is just a, a, a static, pretty standard website layout with some placeholder content. Okay, so I've got a header with a logo and a heading, uh, a horizontal navigation bar that's made out of um, uh, HTML list items. Uh, I've got a main content section, a sidebar section, and a footer section, and it's got some basic CSS styling. So, okay, and I've got two pages. I've got a home page and I've got an about page. Okay, and the files on my server uh, look like this. Okay, I've got CSS folder containing my, my own style sheet and then I've also used normalize.css. Um, an images folder which contains just uh, the, my logo graphic and, and background tile graphic. Um, and a and then I've got my index.html file and my about.html file. Okay, so in the static web in the static website, we have essentially one one HTML file for each page that we have on our site. Okay, that's that's what it looks like. So the process of the process of adding to this website now, uh, if in, in a static website, if I want to add a third page, is going to go something like this. I could write it from scratch or I could save a little bit of time if it's going to look similar by, uh, by maybe copying, uh, copying and pasting one of the files that I already have. Um, let's go like that and okay and then modifying this file here. So I've copied and pasted the index.html file uh, and and I've called it page 3.html. Okay, so now what I need to do is modify the content, of course. Okay, so I'll change the title to page 3, and then we'll have some. Uh, we'll have some page 3 content there. Um, also, I'm going to need to go and then update the navigation. Okay, so add another list item there to page 3.html, change the name of that. Okay, but not only, not only am I going to have to do that there, I'm going to have to then go and reflect that change in my index page and also in my about page. Okay. Okay, and my home page is needs to be uploaded, I think. Okay, there we go. So now I've added another page. Okay, and now let's say I want to go and change the title. 
the heading of my web page. Okay, now I've got three pages. I have to go and change that in in multiple different places. Okay, so in my index page, I've got to change it in the title here. So let's say I want to change from my static site to Dave's static site. And I have to do that there, there, in the about page, twice, and in page three, twice. Okay, save those, upload, refresh, okay, and those changes are made. Okay, and then every little change I want to add to this, if I want to add another CSS file, I have to do it on every page. If I want to make a change to the footer, I have to do it on every page. Um, if I want to make a change to the menu, I have to do it on every page. Um, so already this is becoming annoying and I only have three pages. Um, you can only imagine how impossible it's going to be when you've got, you know, significantly more than that. Um, so I'm, sh I'm, I'm sure this is something you, that you've already experienced when, when creating websites before and, and, and surely there's a better way and there is and so that's, that's one of the first things that uh, I will show you. So what I'm going to do is, uh, what I'm going to do is copy, I'll, I'll, st I'll start from this basic side, I'll copy across all of the, the common files that I'm going to need and I will I'll create a new folder called dynamic site okay but at the moment it's just a direct copy of my static site so I'll just make sure that that's up there on the server okay there we are okay so what I'm going to what I'm going to do now is um, what I'm going to do now is show you how we can uh, start avoiding some of these repetitive tasks by employing the, the dynamic um, features of PHP. So first of all, what I'm going to do is get rid of my page three. I don't don't want it. Don't care about it right now. Um, and get rid of that. Get rid of that. Close. Close. Okay. Go back to just my original navigation. Okay, so now I'm just back to my original two pages. Okay, so the first thing I need to do if I'm going to include PHP inside of this file is I can't call my I can't call my file index.html anymore. I'm going to change it to index.php. So that any PHP code I write inside there will be interpreted and, and executed on the server as PHP. Now the first thing I'm going to show you is um, something that allows us to essentially break up or modularize our code. So that if we've got common, common pieces of code across multiple pages, we don't have to keep writing that out every time we want to make a change or every time we want to create a new page. Okay, and 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 this is this is going to be one of the core things that you would do when creating a, a, a WordPress template as well um, in, in, in a sim similar way. So I can I can say across these two pages, okay, across these two pages there's there's parts of it which are, are very similar. Okay, the whole header section down to the navigation is is pretty much identical. Um, the footer and then the sidebar is really not going to change. The only section that's really going to change is is this section here the, the main content. So, so what I'm going to do, um, what I'm going to do first of all, and I'll close that um, about.html, what I'm going to do is take my index.php file and I'm going to select the part of part of the code which essentially represents this whole header section and the navigation. Uh, and so down to about here and I'm going to cut that and I'm going to create a new PHP file and I'm going to call that header.php okay and I'm going to paste that uh, I'm going to paste that code uh, by itself just for that section into this header.php file 
So if I were to go and load now my index.php file, okay, you can see that, no, that, that the code that I cut out of there is, is no longer there, okay, it doesn't exist. And because that section also had my links to my CSS fi files, um, none of the styles are being applied. Okay, if we if we inspect it, we can see uh, the HTML starts at this 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 uh, div with an ID of main. Okay, but what I'm going to do now is come back to the index.php file, and I'm going to write some PHP here, and I'm going to use a PHP statement um, which will allow me to essentially. Uh, include that that header PHP file in this file where I write this statement. So there's a couple of there's 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 a few ways that I can write this. As you'll find in PHP there's there's lots of different ways of doing very similar things. So you may see this written as include and then the path to the file that you want to include. So in my case header.php Okay, you may also see this written as require, and then you also may see it written as either include once or require once. The difference between the, the, the require and the require once means that if we write, if we, if we write require once multiple times it will, and it's already been loaded, it won't bother attempting to load it again. But essentially they all, they all do the same thing. I think in my final example I've, I've used require once everywhere, but if you were to use any of the others it, it wouldn't make a difference in this example. Um, okay, so just to keep it consistent with, my, with the, the code that I have there already, I'll, I'll use require once, and as I've got that in there, I will now refresh this and what this is going to do, okay, is go and look for header.php and essentially it's going to go cut and paste that right here and then output that as the, the final HTML document. Okay, so again remember I'm not going to see any PHP here, I'm going to see the result of the PHP being executed, which in this case is to go grab that bunch of code and then inject it where that bit of PHP I wrote actually was. So I'll refresh this page now, and uh, let's see, hang on. Uh, okay, I've got something going slightly wrong here. Let me just. Uh, hang on, I think I know. Oh, that should be right. Huh. Ah, there's my problem. Sorry, I put my header.php file in the wrong place, so I can't find it. Put that in there. Okay, there we go. All right, now it's working. All right, so just to take one step back. Okay, there it is without the PHP code. I add the PHP code here to, to uh, include the header.php code, and then the resulting output, okay, is going to look like the original combined document. And if I look in the HTML, it's not going to look any different here. Okay, it all gets combined on the server side and then output, and my browser just gets given uh, HTML. Okay, so I can do the same thing there with the if I rename my about.html to about.php. Okay, I can do the same thing here. I can get rid of all of that duplicated header code and then simply write again PHP and require the header.php file.
Okay, and now if I go to about.php, okay, it will do the same thing. Now the great thing about this is, now if I want to come back and make any changes to the header, rather than having to do it for every single page that I have, I simply just come over to my header.php file, and if I want to change the, the title of the site, um, say from Dave's static site to Dave's dynamic site, then I just have to do it once here. And I'll just demonstrate yet one more thing here. Because, because the, the name of the site is something that potentially I'm going to want to output a bunch, a bunch of times, what I'm going to do rather than, rather than, having to, rather than writing it out each time, what I'm going to do is uh, store it in a PHP variable. And what, what that means is that now it, I can output that variable any time, so I can call this site title equals, and we'll call it Dave's dynamic site. Okay, so what I can do now is any time I want to output that title anywhere in the site, um, I, I, I can just replace this hard-coded text here with a bit of PHP where I just say echo site title and do the same thing down here okay and now if I come back later on and decide I want to change the title again I don't need to change it here and here I just need to change it up here okay and because this is now contained modularized within a header.php file uh, I only need to edit this header.php file anytime I want to edit anything about the header, as long as it's included in all of my other pages. Okay, so I'll make that, we'll save that change, make sure it's uploaded back to the website. Okay, and now, so we're on the About Me page. Okay, and I can see the title has been updated there. Okay, and remember I haven't touched either index or about.php since this last edit. If I go back to index.php, Okay, then the site title's also been changed there. Okay, so now I've only had to change that, that once. Um, okay, and we can do the same thing with any other repeatable components of the site. So, for example, um, and at this point, at this point I'm actually going to start ignoring about.php. And I'm just going to look at index.php for a bit. But we can do the exact same thing with the uh, sidebar, for example. So I could just grab this, put it in its own PHP file called sidebar.php, and where I remove that from have, might as well just copy this, okay, a bit of PHP, okay, where I want the sidebar to actually be included, and rather than um, requiring header, I'll require sidebar. PHP. Okay, so again, just to show you what it looks like with and without that. So, okay, so I've just when I've when I've removed the HTML content, it's disappeared there, and then we require the sidebar.php file. Okay, and it shows up there. Okay, and again, I can use that same process across any of the other pages, and then finally, um, the footer. I can do again the same thing. So I can put that in its own file, its own component file called footer.php. Okay, and using the same approach, I can use require footer.php. Okay, and there again it shows up like that. Um, Okay, the next thing, next thing I'll demonstrate as uh, part of footer.php um, can be, uh, okay, so this section here um, in my footer where I've got the, the, the copyright date information. Okay, let's just say I haven't edited this since, since last year, 2012. Okay, so it looks like, looks like this here. Okay, its output is 2012. Now every every year that this changes over, this is something I'm going to have to come back and edit, okay, and, and update, and it's bound to be something that I'm, I'm I'm going to forget to do. So with PHP, we can we can automate that 
procedure um, so that we never have to come back and manually change it. And the way I'm going to do that is using, uh, again, the date function. Okay, so what I'm going to do is uh, simply just replace this hard-coded bit of text here and I'm going to replace it with uh, a little bit of PHP which uh, will just again use the built-in date function to access the current year okay and use the echo statement to output it okay so now it will simply use the the system to find the current year and as soon as it ticks over to new year that will automatically update update for me. I don't have to come back and change it. Um, not only don't I have to change it on every single page, but I don't have to change it at all. It will just happen automatically for me. Now the other thing I should point out, which I've just done here, is this is sort of the first time I've really written my PHP like this um, in line with the HTML. Um, and that's perfectly valid, that's perfectly valid way to write it. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't care about how how you where you put the line line spacings and tab spacings and things. As long as it's enclosed in an opening and closing PHP tags, um, then that's that's perfectly legitimate way of writing the PHP. Um, the only reason the only reason that I that you will see it um, written as separate lines of code um, and the reason that I've done it previously in these examples is because when you have multiple lines of code, it's just easier to read if it's not all one massive long line. So I could I could just as easily have, have written written this sort of like like that, okay, and and that sort of thing. Would, would be okay. It doesn't really care. So a lot of the time you'll see one line PHP statements, usually an echo statement embedded within in line with the HTML and, that, and that's perfectly okay to do. Okay, so we've already uh, we've already made our, our website quite a, quite a bit easier to, to maintain the development of. Um, but then we can take it one step further by adding uh, adding a database into the mix. So at the moment I still have my content, my main content uh, hard-coded into the, the HTML page here, okay, so the title and then the, the body text. Um, so the next thing that we usually do is we then separate that raw content out completely from the HTML um, and, and put it in a database. And the reason that we do that is um, is uh, basically because it makes it easier to maintain. If if in if with this method, if I want to change some of this content, I still have to come in here, have access to the web server, open up the files, make a change, and then save them. Okay. And so, in a big website, in a big website, you're you're probably going to have people different people who are the content producers to the people who are actually the the the, the web developers so so with this method i still either have to give someone who's possibly doesn't know what they're doing technically access to the website and risk them messing it up or i have to employ a web developer to um, make all the con content updates in which case it's probably going to be an expensive waste of, of their skills um, but then even on top of that, if you've got any sort of thing where you've got um, user-generated content, then you're not going to want to allow your users to have access to your web server just to update their own page. You can think of what a nightmare that would be if, if you wanted to add a post on Facebook and Facebook had to give you access to their web server to go and change some of the, the, the HTML files. Okay, so it's just not going to happen. So, so gone also is the idea of actually putting content that's 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 liable to change in directly into the HTML. Um, so we're going to rip that out. Okay, and we're going to replace this here with a bit of PHP which will go and pull the information out of a database for us. So now I need to very briefly um, uh, touch on uh, the concept of databases and again as I said this is not anything that you'll need to do for um, when working with WordPress 
um, unless you get into sort of more hardcore WordPress development, but certainly not for this assignment. Um, so what I have is a database. So this might look familiar from, from uh, one of the last slides of my lecture. Um, this is um, PHP My Admin, which is a web interface for administering um, databases on your web server, your web host. Um, and, and so I've created here, I've got a bunch of databases here, and I've created one which uh, is very simple. Uh, so a database, as I think I mentioned briefly before, you can think of a database as a bunch of spreadsheets. Okay, There are a bunch of tables which contains rows and columns of information. And then there's a, there's a, there's a, 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 a language um, called, called SQL, which is the language that you use to, to query those, those records and get information out of them and, and do all sorts of other things to your database. Um, WordPress does all that for you, so you don't need to worry about it. But but essentially, um, that that's that's what a database looks like. So I've got one table here. Think of it as one spreadsheet. And uh, if I look at it, so it's called Pages. So essentially, this table is designed um, just to very simply hold the title and content of each of my pages in my website. So this, this table actually has three columns. It's got the, the title and the content, but then it also, it, I also need to give it another, another column called um, ID uh, because I need a way of uniquely identifying the content so that when I want a particular page, I can tell it to go and, go and get me that page. Um, and we usually use a numerical ID just in case I happen to have two, two pages with the same title, for example. Okay, but that's all it is. It's two rows of information with a title and some content and an ID. Um, okay, now I've got in the final example a file called database.php, which I'm simply going to copy over. And this probably contains the scariest looking code, but it's also the code that you need to care least about um, because you just won't need to do anything like this when you're working with WordPress. But I'll, I'll, I'll explain what it does essentially. So in connecting, in connecting to the database um, with PHP, it essentially is going to need to know a little bit of information. Um, very similar to connecting to an FTP account, there's, excuse me, there's going to be a, um, there's going to be a host URL. In this case, that's the one for the QUT one. There's going to be a, uh, a username, there's going to be a, um, a, a password, and um, that's different. That will, if, you, if you are going to use your uh, QUT um, um, uh, database um, phpMyAdmin, then um, you'll need to set up a different, different username to that, uh, to your regular username, so that, that will be different. So I don't think you can go log into my staff camp with that. Won't work. <laughs> um, and then a, a database name because you can have multiple databases. Um, because you have multiple databases, you need to tell it which one to look for for the, for the data that you're looking for. Okay, and then that's that's all the information you really need to to care about when you're setting up uh, when you're setting up WordPress. You will need to enter this sort of information somewhere, and your your when when you get your web hosting, they will give you that that information. Um, you'll probably need to create the database, but once that's done and you've entered this information, WordPress takes care of all of the the database querying and putting putting uh, content into the database for you. Okay, and then the rest of this code is is simply just does that sort of thing. It it it, it um, accesses information from from the database and returns them as as an array of information. Um, and so I've just got some, you can ignore this function here, I didn't actually use that in the end. Okay, but I've got essentially two functions here, one designed to return an entire list of all of the pages and their content called get pages, and another one that's designed to get just the information for one individual page by telling it the page ID that I want. Okay, so they're my two functions. And that's all, that's, that's all I'll say about this file, that's all, all, all we really need to know, other than these, these are the functions that I'm going to call from using the PHP from my other files 
to get arrays of information from the, from the database back. Okay, so here we are back in my index.php file and this is where I want to call those functions to grab the information from the database and output them here. Um, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to just copy and paste this code and then I'll explain it. Okay, so this is what the PHP code looks like to do this. Okay, and this is sim this is similar to how WordPress will operate, but even WordPress then again the, this the syntax will be uh, even simpler. Um, so I'll skip over this bit first, I'll explain it later, but um, I'll explain the second half first. So the first thing I'm doing is, again, because I need to call those functions that I've written in the database.php file, I've used requireonce.database.php, and then what I'm doing is I'm calling this getPage function and giving it a particular page ID, and that is going to is that that is going to return me then all of the information in one of these rows. Okay, depending on which ID I tell it, it's going to it's going to return me the information, all the information about one particular page. Okay, so I need to know that so I can output the title and the content to the page, and then it's going to store that information as a as a associative array. Okay, so the one that's indexed with with uh, with a text string in a variable that I've created called page, and then later on here is where I um, access the information in that array and output it using the echo statement to the page. Okay, so you'll notice that this title and content here matches up exactly with the name of the columns that I'm looking for. Okay, so, so that's what I was saying when you retrieve stuff from a database, it, it usually gives it to you in, a, in, an, in an associative array where the, where the array indexes are named after the, the, the column, column titles in the, in the database. Okay, and then I simply just have some HTML here, a heading 2, where I output the page title from that array, and then finally the page content. So. I'll just remove these two lines so we can see what it looks like without them. Okay, so I've got my, my web page where I've just simply cut out the content section. Okay, there's nothing there. Then I can add back, we'll add these one line at a time. We'll see the heading. Heading gets output, okay, and there it is. Home, so that's pulling it, that content is being pulled directly from here, okay, home there, and then finally we can output the content as well. Um, let's make sure that's uploaded. Okay, and there it is. So now we've got the, the title and the content output. And if you compare this content again to the content in here in the database, that will be exactly the same. That's the exact content that it's getting. Okay, but again, all the browser's seeing and all the browser cares about, okay, is that it's being delivered at some point at the end of all the PHP execution plain HTML. Okay, so the HTML here looks pretty much exactly like what it would as as a static web page. Okay, it's just what's it's just how that's all being assembled behind the scenes on the server that is different. Okay, now I need to explain what these first few lines of code do. Okay, so you'll notice when you'll notice when I called this get page function that I sent it a page ID variable. Okay, so that that has to contain a number which represents this column in the database, okay, so it's either going to be one or two. Now this, so so we have to have some way then, uh, because now because now I, I, I can entirely ignore the about page as a separate page. I can output any content I want just using this index page. We need some way of of controlling which which page's content is actually going to be output. So that's what this bit of code is all about. Um, and 
the important part of, of this bit of code is this bit here. So, so PHP has, um, as well as built-in functions, it actually has um, some built-in variables. Okay, and this one is a built-in variable called dollars, dollar sign underscore get. Okay, and that's actually an associative array which holds what are called get parameters. Okay, so in this case it's pulling out a get parameter called page. And then it's setting that, whatever that value is, to this variable page ID, which I later send to the get page function. Now this, the reason it's in a conditional statement here, it's basically saying, well, first we have to check if if we've actually if this get variable actually exists. And I'll show you, I'll show you what that means in a second. And if it does exist, set it to that value. If it doesn't, just default to the home page. So set the page ID to be one. Okay, so where does this get variable come from? Well, another cool thing about PHP is we can actually send bits of information to the PHP script through the URL. And if you start to look at any website, any dynamic website, especially somewhere where you will, where you will do a search, okay, maybe we can see if this works. No, okay, they've got their URLs modified. It's a okay. So, but you, you will notice. Uh, you actually no, hang on. Google will do it. Okay, so you can see here if I'm googling the word Brisbane. Okay, as part of the URL. Okay, we get google.com.au forward slash search, and then you'll notice this big long bunch of of other stuff that comes after here. Okay, and one of these, the first one, which is kind of really the most important one, is this. So there's always a question mark and then Q equals um, Google. Okay, so that's shorthand here for saying the query equals, uh, actually, sorry, let me just redo this. Okay, here it is up here. Okay, so let's move slightly along, but we can see here Q equals Brisbane. So this is the Google's web page, okay, and, um, and, and, and this will be done in, in PHP as well. This is, how, this is how it sends that bit of information to the, PH, to the PHP scripts on Google servers so that it knows then to go and consult its databases and return new results of information containing the search term Brisbane. Okay, so we can do exactly the same thing here. So these are called get parameters, and we can have multiples of them. In our case, we just need one to tell it the ID of the page whose content we want. And so the way we do that, as I said, is we simply add a question mark onto the end of the URL, and then we type a name for our get parameter. So I'm going to call it page, and then we say equals, and then we give it a value. Okay, so if I say page equals one, then that's going to be set into this get parameter variable. Okay, looking for page, and then that's going to be set there. So page equals one is, is going to refer to the home page in the database. Now if I put page equals two, okay, you can see that it goes and gets the information for page two. Now as you can see, this is all now still being run off index.php, so not only have I modularized parts of the code, I've now gotten rid of the need to actually have any extra separate uh, um, uh, HTML or PHP files for any of the other content as well. All I need to do is tell it which bit of content to get out of the database and inject there. Now, the only reason that, um, that, that the rest of this is here is saying if, if it's not set, then um, go to page one is because it's going to be common that people are going to come along and they're not going to type in they're not going to type in the page number. So if they if they hit the root URL without specifying that, then it's safe to assume that that they're going to want to view the home page. Okay, so the very last thing we have to do is work this now in to our navigation because our navigation is still looking for HTML files, okay, which aren't there anymore. What I really want is for my navigation to be links that look like index.php and then um, question mark page equals and then an ID number. 
Okay, so I could go and uh, hard code those in. Okay, I could put that. Um, I, I could could have put that in hard coded those into the header, but um, but what I've got here um, now in this example, let's just see, see if this works. No, that's wrong. Um, Okay, it just wasn't it wasn't it wasn't uploaded correctly to the server. That was all. That's fine. So previously in my header, I had this hard coded. Okay, but what I'm what I'm doing here now with this PHP code is I'm replacing that with um, an, another query to the database, which actually just says, "Well, go and get me the list of all of the pages, and I'll use those in order to create my navigation list." Okay, so that's exactly what this does here. So I've got my unordered list still, which is going to contain my list items for the navigation. But inside of that, instead of hard coding them, I'm again requiring the database.php file. Um, so you notice here in require once because I've required that before, it won't load it twice. That's, so that's just to go back to that point, the only difference there. Um, Okay, and then here, rather than using the get page singular and and uh, and sending it a particular ID, I'm calling the get pages function, which will return me a list of all of the pages in that database table, and then I'm assigning those to uh, this variable I've created called pages. Okay, and then I use my for each loop, which we looked at before, which essentially says, well, for each element, for each item in in these pages then refer to that inside of the loop as this variable called page. Okay, so this is actually going to be one of these arrays of arrays. So uh, the, the inside array is going to be the ID, title and content. Okay, and then the, the outside of array, array that contains that is going to be each one of those pages. Okay, so this page variable here is sort of the inner, the inner array. And I can pull out of that the um, page ID Again, by matching up using the associative array, matching up the um, the index here with the column name in the database. Okay, and in this case, all I really need to know—I don't care about the content. I just want to know the page title, so I can use that for the name of the list item, and I want the page ID because I need to use that for the um, for the link. So I pull those two things out and then I echo out for each item in, in this list of pages. Okay, I echo out a list item and a, a, a link, an anchor tag, and then the href I set to be index.php with the question mark and then the page get parameter equals and then using these full stops to, to concatenate or join, I insert in there the ID. So whichever page ID happens to be associated with that um, that page, and then for the text uh, of the the um, the link itself, I will output the title. Okay, so if I again just compare without that, okay, so there's without anything in the in the navigation menu. Put the PHP back in. Okay, there it is, and they output. Okay, and the links all match up for me. Okay, and the very last thing now to demonstrate what should hopefully hammer home that why this is useful. If I if if this is my final site design and I'm happy with this, I can now go and add content to this site without ever having to come back and and modify the 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 PHP files. I can simply go into my database. Okay, and I can just insert a new row of information into my table. So I can create a new page, I'll give it an ID, three, okay, I'll give it a, a title, I'll call this page three, and then I'll put some content in here. So we'll have a, par a paragraph, and I'll just say, um, 
um, page three content goes here. Okay. All right, so now I've got three entries in my database. Okay, so home about me in page three. Now without touching any of the code, I'm going to go back and refresh my, uh, refresh my website. Okay, and not only can I, not only could I go here and put page three, okay, there's page three with the content pulled from the database, but you'll also notice I haven't had to adjust any of the menu either. Okay, that's automatically been added onto there because the code says go get a list of all the pages in the database and then output the, the names and the links for each menu item. Okay, so that's, that's a, a good place to stop. Um, so that's basically the, the, the process and the reasoning behind um, using a, a dynamic, dynamic implementation methodology versus using a static one. And, and even though this is a, a very basic, simple, small site, okay, um, uh, already uh, hopefully you can see the benefits of, 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 of and any additional changes to this in the future would have. And, and those benefits are only going to increase with the, the complexity of the site. And that's fundamentally really the same thing that we're going to be doing when creating the WordPress theme. Um, and usually, usually you will still start off maybe making your design as a, as a static design as that one page just because it's easier to do without concerning yourself with the PHP at that point. And then you will take that and, and um, split it up into the template and then add, add other content. And, and that's pretty much the process that we will go through with, uh, with WordPress as well. Okay, so we will... I'm pretty sure that's everything there is. We'll finish there. As I said, it'll be worthwhile going through, reading through the detail of the information I've put up here, exploring some of these other links. Uh, if, if, um, if you want some more background information, again, I'd like to reiterate, please um, make sure you're doing um, you know, the other design work, process work um, for your assignment as well and just make sure that you have your hosting sorted by um, next week's tutorial. So next, next lecture I'll, I'll, I'll start talking about WordPress specifically and then we'll be looking at, at actually installing and, and, and starting to make WordPress themes next week. Um, are there any questions? No? Everyone's pretty happy? It's not, not too scary? Okay, good. Excellent. Alright, well thanks very much and uh, we'll see you next week.